All right, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Andrei. I work at Meta. I'm uh, part of kernel team at Meta. I'm BPF co-maintainer and most of my work is spent either inside the kernel working on BPF subsystem or helping others use BPF both inside and outside of the company. And today I would like to talk about the tool that I developed over the last few years and I've been using it uh, for Tracing kernel internals, finding bugs, finding problems, helping others understand like why they are getting some problems with whatever they use in the, in the kernel. And I don't know, I find it useful, so I thought that I might share it. Uh, but before I talk about details of the tool, I want to start with just like the motivation, how, how I actually came to the idea that I need this tool, right? Uh, some portions of the kernel, at least, right, have very complicated subsystems, system calls with lots of parameters, lots of different conditions that have to all be satisfied for kernel to, uh, to do something that you ask, right? In this example, I'm showing how many e val values are used inside the core ker BPF uh, kernel source code. There are more than 1,000 e invals that can be returned uh, from system call. And when you do get that e inval, how do you tell like which conditions you didn't satisfy? Sometimes it might be obvious, but believe me, in many cases, it's a head scratcher even for, for, for someone who actually maybe developed that feature themselves, right? So uh, as I said, lots of them, not e invals, of course, but generally speaking. And so Red Snoop was born to help was uh, answering the question like which conditions exactly uh, causing problem like how do we know where the error is originating so we can understand how to fix it or maybe there is a bug and we have to fix the kernel and uh, on at the outset what the tool is called Red Snoop I don't remember if I mentioned but uh, what it is on at, at the like kind of high level it's just a, basically a mass tracer of the kernel function calls but with some smarts, right? It can trace lots of functions very fast. It uses BPF technology under the hood. Uh, and uh, the, the main point of the tool is actually to provide as high signal to noise ratio as possible. So it's not just about tracing, but it's actually about fishing out important events, important information without spending too much time on like sifting through like a flood of data. So the tool itself allows to customize various conditions that define the context in which the data is captured, something like which errors we care about or like whether it's errors or not errors, like what, what are the process names, stuff like this. I'll go through that. But uh, and like the third part of all this is beyond just tracing the internals of the kernel in, in terms of what is being called. Uh, we also very often would like to know what is the return function values, what are the input arguments and, and stuff like that, just to make sense of like, how did we come to the error effectively? And before I go to, into details of the uh, tool interface itself, I, I want to start with like a kind of high level explanation of the overall idea of the session. Uh, and, and like, here is the kind of artificial motivating example. But imagine that you have some functions in the kernel, right? Like function X that might call a lot of other functions. In this case, like I'll be concentrating on function A. And you can see uh, on this graph that it, it's, it can be called from multiple places, right? That, that happens quite a lot uh, in the kernel where you have just some helper function that does some portion of the functionality. It might fail, it might not, depending on like how did we get to it. So in this case, like we have first function A, maybe even error out, but it's not actually what we are interested in. Imagine we are interested in function E, eventually getting the error return from function I through this uh, long chain of calls, right? That's, that's what is interesting effectively. Like the, the second the, this, this call might not be interesting because it, it, it didn't fail, but we want to know this one and how did we get here all the way from here effectively. And so to kind of weed out not interesting cases of the function A calls, we would like to, to basically get to this sort of simplified linearized call. Function X eventually called function E, B, C, A, A failed. And then like we popped out the, the error uh, back. 
That's what we care about, not about this function call, not about this function call. And to help with this, Red Snoop uh, operates at like a two sets of functions. One is called entry functions and others are non-entry, auxiliary, however you want. Uh, and the idea of the entry function is to kind of start the tracing session effectively, right? So whenever we hit any of the entry functions, we start recording any other additional functions. And if any of those return error and in such a way that eventually the entry function returns error as well, then like we will capture this information, emit it. Otherwise, if it all succeeded or not, we would by default just not care about this. And again, getting back to like what, what I started with, right? Like we would be getting some syscalls that would be failing. We wouldn't know why exactly. And we would want to know like what is the deepest and like most specific condition that caused this error, right? And so, so we don't want that, don't want that. We want something like this, as close as possible. It's not always possible in practice, but, but we start there. So Red Snoop allows you to specify those entry functions and additional functions. And that's like the very basics of the Red Snoop. And this is the example default output uh, of the Red Snoop. In this case, I specified that I want to trace BPF syscall itself, right? So uh, I'll get to globs, but basically it's entry to the BPF syscall. And for additional functions that I would record, it's basically all the functions that def defined in the kernel BPF subdirectory, those that are traceable at least. Uh, and if you do get an error, then the output would look like this. And I'll go quickly over like the constituents here. So at the very bottom, like we will get timestamps so we can calculate duration, know when it happened, and also information about the process thread and process ID and the names as well. Then in the middle, that's basically a stack trace. That's usually the most interesting part, right? Like we will have uh, some very early functions that we didn't even specify, as you notice, but they they did happen, right? And this this one is the, the entry function that we asked for. It's, it says BPF suffix, right? You can notice also that um, some of the functions have this additional square bracketed values. Those are the return results. And you can notice that, that they are not uh, printed for all the functions. And that's because Red Snoop didn't know about other functions. It only knew about functions that we specified with this additional function specifier, right? So array map a log, BPF map a log per CPU, says BPF, and x64 says BPF were the ones that Red Snoop tracked explicitly, while the rest just so happened to be in the stack trace. Uh, on the right here, we will have uh, source code line information if the kernel image on your system contains dwarf information. This is usually very, very useful, but not every distro might have it. Uh, additionally, we have latency. Sometimes it's useful, sometimes not. It's, feel free to ignore it. Uh, oh, one more thing. When we do capture stack trace, right, sometimes functions can be inlined. And so you can't really like trace them explicitly. They are not functions anymore. But thanks to the actual stack trace and dwarf information, Red, Red Snoop is able to recover that there were uh, inline function calls. And uh, so it will emit it with this dot prepended to it, just to, to make it obvious that this is inline function. So taking a step back, like the the very first thing that you will always have to specify with this tool is the set of entry functions that would like activate something interesting, set of additional functions with dash A. And uh, sometimes you, you might overshoot with some too generic uh, glob of, of the function names. And so it's also possible to kind of carve out back uh, some functions that are too noisy or not interesting and stuff like this with dash D for deny, uh, you can do that. So using these three uh, arguments, it's, it's it's pretty easy and pretty flexible to uh, how to define like the set of interesting and entry functions. Uh, each of those parameters can be uh, provided multiple times. They are all concatenated. And obviously, deny list takes, takes precedence uh, over any other uh, list. Now, in terms of like how you specify the function, it can be obviously just exact name, uh, but also, Red Snoop understands basic glob with stars and uh, question marks, which is like, super useful. Like for syscalls, for example, I can never remember the prefix, or maybe I don't care. And so usually for me, it's like star, sys, and whatever the syscall name, effectively. But the cool, 
cool feature, I think, is uh, ability to specify functions by their source code location. Uh, this is done with colon prepended specifier for the past, where you can also use glob or you can specify exact uh, file number. Uh, uh, it relies on dwarf, of course, and so if you don't have dwarf, that won't work, but if you do, then this is a huge time saver because functions in the file don't normally follow like exact convention, right? Like even for BPF, uh, we have lots of functions that would have BPF uh, prefix, but not all of them will. And so like if you want to trace everything possible, then then this, this helps a lot. Uh, additionally and optionally, you can specify the module specifier also with glob and everything and this is useful when you're tracing some drivers like you can kind of carve out like only the functions that belong to specific module and uh, again huge time saver i think uh, for those who are not very familiar with kernel tracing though like few few warnings basically not every function there is, that there is in the kernel is traceable with the tools. So Redsnoop consults this special file in the TraceFS and intersects like all the specified functions with the, uh, with the set of available functions. Uh, also, you have to be aware that sometimes compilers are super smart and they will take your, your kernel function, modify it just a just a little bit, like to make it faster, and they uh, and then kernel, uh, not kernel compiler, will prepend some special suffixes. So beware! Sometimes the function that you think you want to trace is not this; it might be actually with some extra uh, suffix. Glob usually helps with that, but you just need to be aware of that. And then this goes without saying, but it might not be obvious. Inline functions are really tricky to trace, and uh, they are not really functions anymore, they are just part of some other function, it's like embedded code, and so Red Snoop cannot explicitly trace it, but as I said, if it happens to be in the stack trace, you will see it. Uh, sometimes it's useful to do the dry run, in which case Red Snoop will do like most of the pre-processing and stuff like this, it will emit uh, like which function it would want to attach to, uh, like what, what kind of function it is and so on. And so using the dry run is a nice way if you are not sure like to check what will Red Snoop do but without like potentially affecting the, the production workload and stuff like this. So use, use dry run and also don't forget to specify verbose modifier just to get a little bit more uh, information. Now, uh, for the second part, like beyond specifying what to trace, we also can specify conditions under which like the traced functions should be recorded. And uh, for that, by default, Red Snoop always records only uh, stack, call stacks that return error. That was kind of the, the initial idea. And so that's a default. And I think it's it's, it's usually what you want, because if, if it's not failing, why would you be looking at this effectively? But it is possible to uh, override this. Uh, what, what is error uh, kind of is a little bit ill-defined, of course, and Red Snoop just assumes that for functions that return pointers, null is error condition. Uh, for functions that return integer or long, uh, th then any negative value would be considered an error. Uh, for void functions, they are assumed non-fallable, of course. Uh, to request all the stack traces, like regardless of errors or not, you can specify dash s for success stacks. Uh, but also you can fine-tune the set of errors that you care about. So sometimes the, it would be like some frequently called syscall or code pass, which might return like eparm, einval, and whatever, but you actually care about specific conditions. So using dash x or dash capital X, you can narrow down like the set of systems. Dash x specifies the errors that you want to trace and dash x is sort of like a deny list of the functions to carve out. So you can you can use either or both to flexibly specify what you want. And again, deny list takes precedence, of course. Also, you can simply specify the thread name or process name. I actually don't remember. We need to check. Uh, probably process name uh, and uh, process ID. And in both cases, it's like both positive and negative filter, depending on what you need. There were cases where interesting uh, problems were only uh, taking like some longer time, something in ButterFS, I don't remember. And so I also added this filter for, for the duration and dash capital L will, uh, will take 
duration, like the minimum duration that is interesting, and everything that finishes sooner will be ignored. All of those conditions, all of those filters can be combined, and normally they would behave in like a sane, predictable way, uh, unless there's some bug then report. And all that is good, but because of all the aggressive uh, function inlining that is happening nowadays with compilers, sometimes the, the error is in the function that got inlined and you can't really get close to it effectively and uh, you'll feel stuck. But thankfully there is this technology called LBR for last branch record, which is a CPU hardware feature where you can set it up to record last n events and like you can actually define what events mean but like most practically useful are either like all the jumps and indirect jumps and uh, branches and all the stuff which is like extremely detailed LBR uh, or it could be just like any function return and then in that case it's sort of like a stack trace but in a log form effectively right so like if you have like some jumps up and down on the call stack it will record like last and uh, returns from the functions. And so this LBR feature serves as like a sort of extension of the stack trace and very often when you are either unfamiliar with that part of the code in the kernel that you are debugging uh, or uh, as I said like if, if the condition is like the failing condition is somewhere in the big function uh, with like lots of inline uh, code, adding this LBR uh, flag will emit like this additional piece of information that might give you kind of next steps where to look for or maybe even like just point out to what the uh, what the condition was and I'll just give you a quick overview of what, like how like what, what the data is basically LBR fundamentally is a is a set like is a array of jumps from to right what is from what is to depends on some configuration but basically it's from to and the next uh, next entry is again from two. So in this case, for example, array map alloc check plus this offset jump to this function at another offset, right? And then from there, it continued sort of linearly uh, in, in the code uh, until we arrived at this location. And then from there, we did like, indir uh, not indirect, like just jump, basically. It changed like from linear execution to nonlinear and so on. And uh, so just keep that in mind, right? Like you, you should read this basically in zigzag form effectively. Plus the inline functions make it a little bit uh, more complicated to read. But like if, if you pay attention, usually it contains lots of useful information. And again, just, just as was default view, we have source code location uh, if Dwarf provides that. And I just want to give like one like real example how detailed that information is to the point where you can like basically point out to a part of the if condition based just based on the LBR. Uh, so the, the case was some some inner function, some checks, uh, uh, security validity checks in the uh, BPF code base. And <laughs> you can see there are lots of different conditions, right, that can cause the same eval. And uh, if you look at the source code information and trace like the line numbers that are reported, you, you can basically reconstruct how this C code behaved. So just in the, in the for, for the sake of time, right? Like we see that we were at 53, then we eventually jumped to 54, line 54, 57, stayed on 57 and jumped to 62. And if you correlate that with source code, you will see that like we read this like per map type, basically per CPU, then we got NUMA node, uh, so on. And then the last code that executed before we jumped to return 62 was 57, which is this max entries or key size not equal zero. And uh, then you'll basically have to make a kind of correlation with what you are sending to the kernel to make sure whether it's max entries or key size. I think it was max entries in this case. But just to give an idea, LBR is very powerful. In this case, by the way, I'm using this LBR any mode, which is like the most detailed, which will record all the uh, inter all, all the jumps, all, all the nonlinear jumps. That's very sensitive kind of mode, like and uh, any sort of kernel infrastructure that goes between the, the erroring function and the red snoop actually getting control to capture some data might pollute a lot of records. So uh, this is not always as useful. Uh, default mode without the any will capture the uh, function returns, and I think that's a good default and it's very helpful uh, when you know only, let's say, 
I know that like sys, BPF syscall is failing. I have no idea why. And I, I, I'm lazy to read the code and guess and whatever. Just specifying LBR without any will give you, you know, like 25 last function returns. Usually that's good enough to know at least next few deeper functions that you would want to trace additionally with Redsnoop and maybe you'll repeat it. And in general, once you try this tool, you will, you will understand that like this tool is not like one shot you won't get answers usually with just one try, but like it's iterative process and you like dig deeper, deeper, deeper until you get to the point where either you cannot dig deeper or it's obvious effectively. And uh, if it's like non-obvious and you, but you know, like roughly like the vicinity of the code where the problem is, then you can use some other tools like Dragon, for example, which uh, Omar gave talk two years ago, I think. It's like very nice complementary tool that allows to inspect the kernel internal state or BPF trace, which is just like a very, very generic tool using BPF for, for peering again into the state of the kernel as, as some changes occur. So definitely keep in mind that Red Snoop by itself won't solve your problems, but it, it's a good complementary to other tools that exist there. So that part covered like this original motivation uh, for finding out where the errors originated from. But as I worked on this tool and as I used it in practice for development and debugging, I realized that there is like a second kind of information that is very useful uh, and all the like kind of build Red Snoop's uh, abstractions and like this entry function, session, filters, all stuff, they're very useful in that as well. And that, that function is just generally seeing what what are the call graphs effectively, right? So kernel has the F graph profiler built in. Like, I don't know if you guys use that. That thing uh, allows you to specify also a set of functions that would be, uh, would be traced. And then you'll get like a kind of big, big pretty verbose text file. And you will see like that function A call, function B, function B exit and so on. So Red Snoop supports that with trace mode, which you activate with adding dash T. And it roughly works the same. You, you can see that if, if you ask that the entry function is BPF proc load, which is like an internal function for uh, loading and validating BPF program, which is usually like what fails uh, when you work with BPF, and then like adding all the, all the traceable functions, you can get like very detailed log of what's going on. And uh, I think I have a notation, yeah. So keep in mind these uh, arrows. The, right pointing arrow means the entry to the function. So in this case, we see that BPF program load was called, right? Then the indentation points like nested level of calls. So in this case, BPF proc load called BPF proc a lock, which itself proc called some other function, BPF proc a lock no stats. In this case, that program didn't call any other functions that we traced. Maybe it did call some other functions, but we didn't trace them, right? So from the Red Snoop's perspective, this is the leave program. So this will be notified with just one entry with this like left, ref, right arrow. Uh, and, and so it, it keeps going and eventually BPF program load exited, right? On the right side, for all the exits of the functions, you will see their uh, return results, which is usually like, if especially if there is an error, it, it's extremely helpful to see how you got there through like what function calls. Duration when useful, but yeah. So this turned out to be like very useful feature. And so I developed it somewhat further. Uh, and most recently added a few kind of often asked features that further help like to debug and uh, inspect kernel. And I, I want to give like kind of hypothetical motivating example. Uh, if you if you ever got like any uh, permission errors when dealing with BPF kernel, uh, sorry, with, with kernel in general, not necessarily BPF, you would know that uh, there is thing called capabilities. And in the kernel, like when you get through all the layers of LSM and all this stuff, eventually it gets to this function cap capable, which has few parameters, like it takes the structure representing the uh, kind of user credentials, some namespacing, the actual capability that's requested, some options, I have no idea what it is. And so if you are debugging errors like this, for example, you would want to know what condition, like what, what are the input arguments to this function that, that cause like, let's say, eParm, right? So just knowing that, cap, cap, so, without any extra features or everything that I showed you before, you would get something like this, right? You would specify that I want to trace sysbpf, uh, I care about cap capable. Uh, in this case, I also narrowed down to just eparm just to reduce the noise and 
tracing function, right? You will see that there were two cap capable calls, both return eParm and then eventually BPFS call return eParm. That's good, but that's not good enough. Like what, what capabilities did we check? And uh, maybe like what user uh, were we checking against, right? So most recently I added the function arguments capture, which in addition to all of the above captures also input arguments of the functions. And I'll start with an example and then go over a little bit like a generalization. But you activate this mode with the extra argument dash a for args. And for each function, it will, if it finds the type information, that this is like a big if, but that's usually how, how it works, right? Like if it finds the BTF information for, uh, for the function, it will extract like what type uh, of the argument, what name of the argument, and it will base like function arguments capture logic based on that. So in this case, it found all the necessary BTF information and it knows that sysbpf has three arguments and then cap capable has uh, four arguments. And you can, you can see a lot just from this. Uh, for example, we know that this is the map create operation that failed. That's actually not obvious. If you look at the source code, there are like about 20 or so uh, commands and you would be wondering which one. Now we know exactly this is map create. Uh, for the cap capable, we, well, first we have user and group ID, if that's what you care about. There's a bunch more, of course, but importantly, there is capability. Unfortunately, it's defined as integer, so it's not as like obvious for a snoop that this is cap net admin. So you would have to do a little bit of searching, but eventually you will find that this is cap net admin. And the second call was uh, cap sys admin 21. So uh, this greatly helps uh, with, uh, with debugging. And just generally, like, especially if you are learning, like you're interested about some new subsystem in the kernel, you want to understand how things uh, work. Uh, Personal example, like perf subsystem, like at some point, like I wanted to understand like actually how things are uh, wired up. And it's actually very hard because perf subsystem is very generic and a lot of stuff is defined as uh, struct operations where you would just provide some implementation of the callback, but in the generic code, you actually will not know what uh, function is called. And so it, it actually kind of stops you at, uh, at that point, you don't know where to look forward. So with Red Snoop uh, and all those features, it's actually pretty easy to understand which specific implementation of the callback was called, and you can like, you know, dig deeper and deeper. Uh, and yeah, and I promised a little bit of generalization and kind of general points. So uh, for function fun function argument uh, capture, Red Snoop will do will try to do a smart thing. So for example, if you have a pointer to a struct, right, just capturing like the actual value of the argument would be just a pointer value. It would be just some hex and, and that won't be useful. So instead what we do, we capture the underlying structure data uh, and, and render it as if it was, you know, the structure that's passed, not like just a, some random pointer. Uh, as I mentioned, this is all uh, based on BTF uh, type, information which nowadays in a lot of distros and like definitely in our production kernels we, we always ship kernels with like full BTF information and uh, it's pretty compact and it's extremely useful at runtime for tools like Red, Red Snoop or BPF Trace. And so using BTF we will fetch the argument names, uh, we will use the memory layout uh, definition of the structs to render it in a uh, compact C-like uh, form that I just showed. Uh, also keep in mind that for we will always keep like all zero fields, or all zero structures if they are embedded. So if, if some portions of the structure are mem set to zero and never updated, we will skip them just to re reduce the clutter. Uh, and uh, in ARMS, as you saw with the map create, for example, in latest upstream kernel, this is actually in ARM and that's why Red Snoop is able to symbolize uh, the value. Um, for integers, I'm trying to guess sort of like what kind of integer it is. And if it's small enough, I'll emit it as decimal. But like if it's something that looks big, then it will be hex. And usually that's more practical. Uh, the, the big kind of warning is that this is based on tracing and BPF. And so everything has to be sort of have maximum sizes supported. So there are some limits into uh, to, to like how much data a Snoop can uh, capture. They are tunable by default. They are not like the maximum possible one because that would be like just too too verbose for, for some of the use cases. But you can always adjust that. And like I suggest looking into this config help 
I'll mention it later for args dot prefix uh, config arguments. Like you, you can specify like like what what would be the size of the string that you capture, what would be the, the maximum uh, binary data that you capture, stuff like this. So the last thing that's also also was recently added. Uh, so it needs a little bit more battle testing, and I hope to get some more feedback from from my users. Are uh, injected point probes. Point probes here is kind of the, as a counterpart to the function entry and return, which is like the main mode of operation for a uh, red snoop, which by the way, that's why red snoop. It's because function returns, you know, function entry is good, but without function return, you can't really tell much. And so point probes, are, in addition to all the function entry and exit uh, calls that uh, red snoop will, will trace, this allows you to somewhat fight the uh, the problem with tracing inline functions, for example, because you can specify using this kprobe uh, prefix, you can specify the function and then offset within the function to point to an exact instruction where you want to capture state. And like for kprobe, like in this case, the state will be registers. I'll get to that in a second. Uh, kprobe is not the only one that is supported. Uh, before I go to the next one, it just we will emit the, those probes that were actually hit as part of this function called graph, basically, uh, with uh, the special fancy bullseye uh, character. So what is supported? K probes and K red probes. So uh, for K probes, you can optionally specify the offset. So in that sense, you can trace the inline functions or like the in, like somewhere in the middle of the function. This doesn't happen often, but sometimes you do have to go to a, like all the way to assembly instruction level, and like very often you'll be like, if only I could see what was the value of this register at this point. And so Red Snoop allows you to do this actually now. Uh, in addition, we can uh, capture red probes. There are also registers to, uh, at that at that point, which might be interesting. Uh, Trace points are supported, and for trace points, we will capture all their kind of like nicely formatted uh, human readable arguments. But we also support raw trace points, which uh, basically capture only like the, the actual arguments that kernel passed them before they went through like this extra layer of formatting. So sometimes actually one use, uh, like trace points are useful because they have like nicely formatted process idea or whatever and you don't have to, don't have to fish it out from, from some like deeply nested structures. But in some cases you do actually want like that raw structure that is passed to the, uh, to the probe, to the trace point. And so Red Snoop supports both. Uh, and uh, if I go back, I didn't mention that, but you can see that here I specify this extra argument. That's what I mentioned, like go look at the config help. Uh, this thing allows to specify kind of the formatting output mode. There are three, like by default, it's a compact one. That's actually not the one that I'm showing, but the, the default one actually will kind of shift it at, to the side and will emit it at the same line. But it was like way too wide for the presentation. It assumes you you will have like a wide terminal. So I used the, the other method, uh, which is called multi-line, where each argument gets its own line. It's slightly less shifted. It, it's pretty, pretty clear here, but in addition to that, there is verbose mode for those cases where you're basically debugging, but you cannot step, stop the system. So for registers, for example, for kprop, you actually will get like a full PTRX structure with all the all the registers. And keep in mind, all the registers that are not printed here are zero, effectively. So with this, like you can do like very time consuming, but very detailed uh, debugging if you need to. So just keep in mind, like you, you'll need this arcs format mode verbose and you will have it uh, in the config uh, help output. I'll, I'll point to that soon. So how do you, that's all the features that I was going to uh, to cover. How do you get Red Snoop to try? Well, Fedora and Arch Linux package it. The latest version is 0 0.10. Uh, it has all the features that I mentioned. Uh, but if you are not lucky to be one of the users of, of those uh, distros, you can either build from source code or ask your distro to package it, of course. Or, or you can you can have uh, you can download pre-built x86, 64, and ARM64 uh, binaries. Like we automatically build them with each release, and so that might be the the, the fastest way to try it out if it's okay with you. Uh, some pointers source code and 
sort of doc documentation in the pretty detailed readme is at the GitHub. Uh, I also have a complementary blog post, effectively, with a little bit more details. It's slightly more verbose than readme still, uh, but I think it's useful to, to get the feel for the tool. Uh, I spent some effort to make the help and like this extra configuration help uh, as usable as possible without like overburdening user with more details than necessary. So definitely check that out for, for other tiny things that I didn't cover in the presentation. Uh, I think it's, it's useful to have a good idea of what's possible, even if you can't remember all of it. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's all I have. Thank you. Any questions? Hello. Um, first of all, thank you very much for the tool. Uh, I've used it previously, and uh, it helped in debugging some issues. Nice. And sp sped it up, really. Uh, I had uh, two questions regarding the LBR mode. Uh, the first one is whether the LBR subsystem or something can be can be interacted uh, with it using BPF. Uh, the reason I ask is maybe that could allow Red Snoop to be more surgical about when it turns LBR on and off, so you could have the uh, collect uh, information with LBR any mode without losing records because, uh, you know, the kernel op took over and uh, you end up losing data. So I'm trying to understand the question. You're asking whether we can uh, turn off and on LBR more dynamically, or yeah, uh, well, uh, or specify uh, at what point in the stack trace you turn LBR on, so mm. you uh, get the records uh, in the verbose mode uh, without losing them. Yeah, so I don't think there is like that much control, and it's like a hardware feature. The way that this is all kind of wired in the kernel, like you need to create a special perf event for each CPU and say like, please start collecting LBR. And that's hardware feature it has no overhead as far as I know. Uh, and like the only thing that like we added for like Red Snoop basically to, to be able to use LBR is like a way to cap like not even capture this data, but record a snapshot of that data at some point, right? And so so that's where I have control of when to capture uh, when to kind of take a snapshot of LBR. And to that point, like normally I would do like Red Snoop, not I <laughs> I don't do it. Uh, Red Snoop would capture it at the like deepest nested function that is failing, and that's sort of like the default behavior, but, but it, it can actually capture it at those uh, injected uh, single point probes. You would need to use like this advanced feature that I mentioned, like it's called interim stacks, where it would output trace and stack tra like the call stack uh, before it actually completes. So like as soon as you get to kprobe, it will capture LBR, it will show that like, oh, we called this, that, and that, and right now we at kprobe, and this is the LBR at that point, right? And so I think that might be useful for you. Okay. It's and a little bit more verbose. You will have like few, few calls for the same session, uh, but it gives a lot of information. It's just like quite advanced use case. So I didn't want to overburden the presentation with it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and the second question I had was uh, quite some time ago I tried to use the LBR mode in uh, VM running with KVM. Is that does that work or does it, it used not? to work and then it stopped? I don't remember what happened, but uh, either I cannot set up my Q, QM or my VM, or it just does not support. I think there were some changes in the subsystem. Maybe they just like disabled that. Uh, so it probably just doesn't work. But it's not Red Snoop. It's like perf subsystem doesn't allow you to set up this as a hardware feature or something. Okay, and that's an issue with perf or with KVM? Uh, do, would you know? Like, uh, it might be some KVM uh, limitation. Yeah, okay. I I do not know. It's it's a bit too deep for me. Okay. But but yes, LBR is very useful. It's very finicky. Sometimes it doesn't work, or sometimes it will just have a garbage that's not useful. Very often, what happens is your function is failing, right? Like somewhere in the middle, and then it has lots of cleanup, lots of freeing stuff like that. That completely pollutes the LBR because you usually have 32 uh, entries there. And so for that, I actually added those K probes uh, support, so I can actually say, okay, no, capture LBR like before I get to all the freeing and all stuff. Again, advanced use case, it's very time consuming, but like when you need it, like that's still time saver. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and, and then again, like the, there is AMD is a separate issue and like we've been adding those uh, support, support for that like over time. So definitely prefer to use the latest kernel possible to get all the, all the functionality. I'm waiting for uh, ARM64 to get the support for this as well. 
th there are some patches upstream. Yeah. I think there was some other question. Yeah. Can you um, maybe, I, I would, for those type of tasks, I would use F-Trace, but you have developed your own tool. Maybe you can say what was missing in F-Trace or? Yeah. Uh, basically, like, signal-to-noise ratio, as I mentioned, right? With Red Snoop, I wanted to capture only stuff that is failing. So I, I wanted like more relative stuff. With F-Trace, you would have to specify that, like, please trace all these functions all the time, or like for some duration, and then you have to sift through them like to see like which one is actually like belonging to your error uh, error case. And so I wanted more control, more flexibility. And this this being BPF based, I can actually add more conditions, more filters. So for example, one of the things that people requested was requested was like C group filter, right? It's very trivial to add right now with like everything that's built into a Red Snoop. And so you, you can have like this carving out like what's interesting and how to ignore the rest of the uh, of the calls and narrow down. So I think just being able to iterate without having to rebuild the kernel, like redeploy the kernel in production, this is very important. So, yeah. Uh, I had uh, one other question regarding the injected probes. Uh, so uh, if my understanding is correct, if you have something like uh, config K probes on ftrace enabled, uh, K-probes uh, use the F-trace subsystem, so that would limit them only to the function entry and exit. So mm -hmm. how do you uh, use uh, implement the injected point probes then? Yeah, the, the, so BPF uses all that subsystems as well as a, like a low, lower level uh, layers. I, it's a, I, I agree it's a little bit confusing even for me, and, and I worked with that like for quite a while. What, what you are talking about is entry and exit only, that's F-trace, but there is also K-probe, and K-probe allows, it, and it's different subsystem, different way to, to trigger like BPF and like generally do tracing, and K-probe itself, it's slower, but it allows you to attach it arbitrary instructions with some limitations, but generally speaking, it's like some instruction in the middle of the function, and like the reason they do it because they use a completely different mechanism for like triggering some action when, when you hit like the, the instruction. Uh, F-trace is faster because it's just a jump, uh, but it requires kind of properly compiled uh, function with like five bytes at, at the beginning and stuff like this. That's why it only works at entry and exit, while K-probe will install breakpoint and replace any instruction. And you can access the second uh, uh, category of K-probes with BBF as well? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Hmm? Um, this topic with the uh, inline functions can be changed by uh, there's a there's a compiler flag. Uh, would that be possible, or is it not possible? W what's the flag? What does it do? Uh, it says no inline, I think. Or oh yeah, like but uh, so. Keep in mind, this is all used to debug production systems, not like, well, okay. it's useful for local development, but it is used in practice to develop okay. a production system, and there, like, it's not an option to disable inlining. Okay. Yeah. And, and generally speaking, I, I don't even know if, if you can compile uh, kernel with, like, no inlining. You, you can't even compile kernel with uh, optimizations disabled, for example. Yeah, maybe I, I would just think about compiling uh, um, only, only one driver. With this and not the entire yeah, yeah. so uh, you, if you have, you know, if you, can, you have support, uh, access to source code and you can recompile the kernel and like, redeploy it and all this stuff, you can just mark a function as no inline or like you make it weak and then compiler cannot inline it. So if you have that control, that will help you. Uh, but then usually you, you also can add printk and, and get what you need, like even maybe faster or like more, more details or more, you know, it's, it's all trade offs. Like here, the sort of the, the idea is like, the assumption is that you cannot modify the kernel, or you do not want to modify the kernel to save time and effort. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, let's assume I want to use this tool on other platforms than x86. Uh, what difficulties should I expect? Uh, so, as far as I'm aware, and actually, I mean, I know, it works at ARM, on ARM64. Uh, other other platforms, I didn't test, but they should work for the most part, because at least over the last few years, BPF support, like, of different features that Red Snoop relies on, caught up for, for like, all the minor uh, platforms. I think, like, RISC-V should work. 
uh, MIPS should work, S390X should work, maybe PowerPC, I don't know. So uh, the short answer, I don't know for sure, but just give it a try. But like basic stuff should work. The only, the only kind of thing that to keep in mind is Red Snoop is smart about using like the very latest, the most efficient, like the fastest ways to do the same thing. And like in kernel, there are usually like few different ways to do things. So for example, if you attach to many functions, like the, the example is the, the examples that I showed where you do this, oh, where you specify, yeah, functions just like all the functions in like all those files. I don't remember exact number, but it will be like hundreds, if not more than a thousand or two thousand functions. So depending on like how old your kernel is and which architecture, that attachment to a thousand functions can be either instantaneous or very slow. Uh, but but once attached, like it functions the same. So it's more about usability rather than like functionality. But you know, waiting five minutes for to attach a few hundred functions is really annoying, believe me. So, so on x86 it will work. On ARM64 it won't because it doesn't have some some kernel feature support. It hopefully will will be fixed soon. But like the basic stuff, like all the same data will be captured, unless there's some BPF feature that I forgot and it's not supported on some specific uh, architecture. ARM64 and x86 is what I actually test. Any other questions? I think we're already running late. All right, thank you very much.